welcome back to my channel. So my name's Fanula, thank you for joining me. Today we'll be looking at Irish bardic poets and shanakis. So they're quite interesting, or I think they are. A bit more of a jolly topic than the ones we've been doing recently. Bards and shanakis are really interesting figures in Irish history. They are really important in passing on historical knowledge and they're a big factor in Irish society and culture. We'll do like a brief overview of what bards and shanakis are and why they are important in Ireland or were more important in Ireland than they are now. We'll get into that. For some background for bardic poets is the first group we'll start with. So Shanakis were preceded by bardic poets. Bardic poetry was written in early Irish to middle Irish and bards were traditionally trained in bardic schools so it was like a kind of university for bardic poets. So through this there's a clear implication that bards were from middle class backgrounds or well upper class backgrounds. They were part of the kind of aristocracy and came from wealth backgrounds so they didn't have to go into farming and things like that. The poetry by the bards was a product of Gaelic Island which came to an end in the 17th century as a result of the absolute bad man Oliver Cromwell. We are not fans on this channel. I'm not going to go into too much into that I'm going to try and keep this lighthearted but if you know anything about Irish history you'll know why Oliver Cromwell is a bad dad. And that is so unusual for that crispness of expression. So bards would share their poetry orally but rather than having them written down. The power of spoken word and poetry was very important in Ireland and I'll this still continues to be to this day. Bards composed their poetry in darkened rooms and composed poetry by memory rather than writing it down. Irish poetry followed a set of rhyme schemes, metaphors and symbolism. So bards were actually hired by kings and lords to create poetry complimenting them, basically bigging them up so the bards would travel around and give their accounts of how great the lords and kings were. So the bards are basically like modern day influencers with poetry, if that makes sense. That's the best way I think of putting them as like, they're like influencers because they try to influence people through like pictures in people's minds rather than pictures on like Instagram. I thought it was a clever way of putting it anyway. Bards weren't just strictly employed by kings and lords, they also wrote their own poetry for their own amusement. Things about romance and satire, like comedic sort of poetry also. And even as Ireland transformed from a pagan country to a Catholic country, the importance of poetry still continued. And bards were like an early type of historian, like they could recite things that happened through history all orally and bards would pass on their knowledge to the next set of bards. It's like an intergenerational passing through of poetry and spoken words. So some things that bards could recite would be things like the dealings of kings and lords, music, comedy, medicinal cures. They were like an early type of like Google. The influences Google, they're all sorts of modern day equivalents, aren't they? So one particularly interesting example that I came across was a poem about the flight of the Earls. So on the 4th of September 1607, the flight of the Earls occurred, which is when the Earl of Tyrone and Tyrconnell set sail for France from a ship in Rathmullen in Donegal. They ended up living in Italy after some diversions through Normandy and the Spanish Netherlands. And the Pope set them up with a nice little pad in Rome and looked after the Catholic Isles. And this was paid for by Philip of Spain. So this leads us to look at the death of Ireland. By now, I know I've got an Irish name, but some of these names take the biscuit, okay? So we'll try. So this, look, <laughs> this leads us to look at the death of Ireland by Fia Flaha O'Neill, a bardic poet. Look at us, we did it. Well, those of you who, who know me, <laughs> <laughs> There's like my thousands of followers. <laughs> if you'd know that my sister's called Neve, but this is a different spelling of Neve. This is like G N I M H. Skinny blister is N I A M H. Fun fact. Fun fin fact. I say to buy a journal O'Boyle, and Neve's belief is that Ireland is dead and that the Irish cause has been lost. Obviously, it shows quite a lot of how people felt about the Catholic cause potentially being lost or it becoming weakened. But a more fun example of bardic poetry is The Butter, which was created by Tai Dal Ochyun. This is a satirical piece and comments on the multicoloured butter that Tai was gifted. He stated it was white butter, bluer than coal. He stated that it destroyed me, which just made me laugh. Butter dramas. That would have been a better name for the collection. Who are you smiling at? It's all the drama, Mick! I just love it! Okay, so we go from bards to shanakis. It's more of a storyteller type figure rather than just strictly poetry or just strictly work commissioned by kings and lords. They became more of a source of entertainment for normal people. After the Battle of Kinsale in 1601-2, the aristocracy who employed the bards were wiped out. 
Bods therefore no longer had a guaranteed income and had to change their role to make money and continue their role in society as they no longer held an esteemed position. And Bards then became revered as storytellers known as Shanakis. Storytelling was one of the main forms of entertainment in Ireland. Shanakis would travel from village to village and tell all sorts of different stories to entertain local people. They would still continue the history aspect of it, they would still continue on, you know, stories that have been told for hundreds of years, like folklore stories. They would also have more satirical ones that make people laugh. And I'll put an example in of Eamon Kelly, who tells this funny little story about tea. I just think that the Shanakis way of telling things and like Irish, old Irish people telling stories is just quite comforting to me. I don't know why. Because all my family are Irish and old. <laughs> I think it's quite nice. So I thought I'll put a little clip in of that now. I'm bringing you back now to uh, the time when tea was introduced into Ireland. And the Irish people took to drinking tea like ducks to water. Well, it wasn't available in the shops when it came out first, but men used to go around from house to house in a pony and trap selling the tea, and they were called tea men. Now, it so happened that a tea man put up with a husband and wife in a single-roomed house in which there was only one bed. And he wouldn't have put up in that house at all that night, the tea man, only it was so wet and so stormy, he couldn't get to his own lodgings. Now he put the pony into a makeshift shed that was at the gable of the house outside. And when he went in, the young woman of the house, she had taken up a cake of bread out of the oven. And she brought the cake of bread across the floor and she put it up over on the shelf of the dresser. Oh, there it was, a beautiful wheel of bread with a cross on it like the four spokes that you see on a wheel and the lovely aroma that was from that cake oh the tea man's nostrils you could you could see him and you know that his teeth were swimming inside in his mouth for a bite of it <laughs> and she seeing the hungry look in his face she was going to break a piece off the cake and give it to him and the husband said no he said you'll only ruin that cake now if you break it while it is hot so can't he wait until morning like the rest of it well, that was that. There's no good in going arguing with a cranky husband. They knelt down and they said their prayers and they all got into bed, the one bed. The wife got in near the wall, the husband got in next to her, and then the tea man got in on the outside. <laughs> God knows, and that was a narrow enough bed too. And when one of them had turned, they'd all have to turn. <laughs> Folklore tales have been around for centuries. An early example is found in the Book of Leinster from the 12th century, which contains 187 different tales. So you might already know some Irish folk tales. For instance, my name comes from the Children of Lear. Um, I was a swan, so that's cool. Names like Aoife, Con, Oisin, names like that, that really old Irish names have been around for centuries. And the very best, of course, is Fanula. But Shanakis would also tell stories of genealogy and would carry on history of Ireland, but some people weren't literate, especially like small villages, so they couldn't read or write, and the Shanakis would tell them their own history, basically. Jack Lynch described Shanakis as reporters, historians, and entertainers all in one. Seems like he's right. By the 1950s, there's a decrease in the popularity of Shanakis as television and radio became more popular. You wouldn't have to wait for fireside entertainment night, you could just turn on the telly. There are some festivals which continue to celebrate Irish traditions. There are festivals where just the Irish language is spoken, where mamas will dance, and they also have storytelling festivals for the Shanakis. So for example, the St. Patrick's Festival in 2019 had a five day program of storytelling, which was supposed to showcase the very best of traditional and contemporary Irish storytelling. Oral history is important, especially in societies where lots of people are illiterate. But yeah, I just think it's quite a nice thing. And apparently my great-grandfather was a Shanakis, and so they just go around telling little stories. Apparently my great-grandfather didn't speak any English, so he'd have a English translator, and he'd like tour around. Apparently he went to Scotland to go and do them as well. I think that Shanakis have a slightly different name in Scotland and in the Isle of Man, but apparently they exist there as well. So thank you for watching my little bar to Shanakis video. Hope you enjoy. <laughs> thank you for watching.